John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. This is how my Bible reads out of the New International Version. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it would bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit of itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I want to reiterate for extra emphasis verse 5. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. For the moments that you will allow me uh, your attention, I want to preach this weekend using as a subject, stay connected. Stay, stay connected. Let's go to God in prayer for our sermon. Father, while it's my voice, the voice that's being heard, we recognize, God, that it is your word that's being spoken. And so, God, we thank you for your word. God, we believe that your word is true. We believe that your word is powerful. We believe that your word is relevant and applicable for our current situation. And so, God, our prayer is very simply this. For the moments that are ours to share, I pray, Father, that you would gather all of our scattered and fragmented thoughts. And allow us, uh, allow them rather to be centered in on what you have to say to us in this moment. I pray personally that as I preach that you would, in the language of the old preacher, let me down into the deep mysteries of your word. Would you allow me to preach with power, clarity, and with conviction? God, we need you to make this word come alive in our lives. So that every person who will hear it, whether they are watching it live or they will watch it later, God, would be the better and would know that you have spoken to them. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said together, amen. Stay connected. My brothers and sisters, currently on our dining room table is a vase that is full of red roses that I had recently bought for my wife. As an expression of affection, admiration, and appreciation as we celebrated eight years of marriage together. Our wedding anniversary is July the 28th. And on that day, I decided to surprise Joanna with these bright, beautiful, and brilliant roses. When I, when I gave them to her, they were dazzling and immaculate. The leaves were nice lush and green. The head of the stem had budded quite nicely. These were some pretty flowers. But regrettably, my brothers and sisters, today as they sit on our dining room table some three weeks later, what was once brilliant and bright has now become brittle. What was once lush has now become lackluster. What was a dazzling bouquet of roses has now become dead. And if I've got to be honest, I can't quite understand how they died so quickly. Now, I'll be the first to tell you I'm not a green thumb. I don't have a green thumb. But, but I do know that if you want plants to live, you got to make sure that the conditions are right. And so when I bought them from the florist, I had the florist to put them in water. I made sure that they got the proper sunshine. I gave them plant food because I wanted to make sure that these roses were in the best conditions to flourish. But even though they were in the right conditions, they still died. And I got to admit, I've been looking at those flowers for the last week, and I've been feeling some kind of way about these sad-looking dead flowers that's been sitting on my table. 
Because when I bought these flowers, I paid some good money for them. And because I paid good money for them, I thought that I would get a little bit more bang for my buck. I thought I had more time with these flowers. I thought that they would still have some form of vim, vigor, and vitality. I thought that three weeks later, these brilliant, beautiful bouquet of roses would still have some level of life inside of them. But here we are some three weeks later, and now I'm going to have to throw them away. In fact, I almost threw them away last night. But when I went to grab them, they started preaching to me. They, 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 they said to me, V, we can tell you ain't been pleased with us because we've been watching how you've been watching us over the last week. We've been catching your little attitude toward us as you've been sitting at the table this past week. And so before you get rid of us, we, we, we need to correct your thinking. We don't want you throwing, a, throwing us away with some bad thinking about us. And we figure you probably didn't realize this, but we didn't just die a couple of days ago. No, we were dead three weeks ago when you spent all that money and gave us to Joanna. I said to them, huh? That, 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 that can't be true because when I gave you to Joanna, they were, you were bright red. Your leaves were green. In fact, that's the reason why I picked you because when I saw you in the flower shop, you were the most beautiful and brilliant bouquet of roses in the whole store. You got to explain to me what do you mean you were dead three weeks ago? How were you dead but you still had signs of life? And they said to me, V, what you didn't realize was that the moment we were cut from our garden was the moment that we died. They said, we, we, we know we look alive, but the truth of the matter is the minute we were disconnected from our source of life, the countdown on the remainder of our life began and our march toward our demise ensued. And while you did everything in your power to provide for us the proper conditions for growth, the truth is all you were doing were helping us to become more comfortable in our last moments. Because in order for us, this is what they said to me, in order for us to remain alive and in order for us to produce, we don't just need the right conditions. What we need is the proper connection. I highlight this, my brothers and sisters, as the introduction to our sermonic presentation this weekend because I believe these dead roses on my dining room table provide for us an ocular demonstration of the value that is found in staying connected to the life source. My brothers and sisters, I believe that's God's word for somebody who's watching me this weekend because when you do uh, it and, and, an intense investigation on your spiritual life, for some of us, if the truth be told, you've been focusing on making sure that you have all of the right conditions attached to the spiritual life, but it has been the void of a deep connection with your life source. And my brothers and sisters, what God wants for you and I to understand is that in order for us to grow and produce... We don't just need the right conditions. What we need is the right connection. This is what Jesus, in my estimation, teaches uh, the disciples in John chapter 15 and to us by extension this weekend. Let, let me set the scene for you. We, we are in the final scenes of Jesus' life. And to this point, we've noticed that over the last few moments, he has washed the disciples' feet. He has led them in a final, final meal. He has instituted the Lord's Supper, and now he is on his way toward God's plan and purpose for his earthly existence, which, of course, you understand, culminates in a three-hour battle with sin and death on that skull-shaped hill called Calvary. And on his way toward the cross, ladies and gentlemen, he decides to make a stop over in the Garden of Gethsemane where there he would pray and prepare for what was ahead of him. Because he understood that it would be there in the Garden of Gethsemane where he would be arrested. And so they... They leave the upper room, Jesus and the disciples, and begin walking toward the garden. And as they're walking toward the garden, he wants to make sure that they are prepared for what is ahead of them as well. Jesus, knowing that his physical presence with the disciples uh, would soon be coming to an end and knowing that these men would need a clear understanding of who they are. Are and what their position would be in this grassroots movement called the way, Jesus decides to give them one more object lesson. And so on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus and his disciples pass by a vineyard. 
And as they walk by, he points over to the wall, uh, points over the wall of the vineyard at the rows and rows of grapevines with their branches snaking along the wooden fence. And he says to them, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Jesus here uh, chooses to employ the imagery of a vine as a way to describe the new relationship that he and the father desired to have with all of his disciples. And I highlight this because I believe what Jesus teaches us here, and this really is the whole sermon in a sentence. Jesus wants us to know that the key to our survival as believers, again, is not contingent on our condition, but it is contingent on our capacity to stay connected to to the life-giving source that is Jesus Christ. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you go on and type in the comments, stay connected, stay connected. And so Jesus tells us here that if you and I are going to experience and enjoy true and genuine fellowship with the Father, we have to stay connected. And he tells us, stay connected, number one, because there is a power in partnership. There is a power in partnership. It's right here in verse number one. Jesus opens the chapter by declaring, I am the true vine. Now right from the start, right from the rip, Jesus establishes himself as the source of our survival. He is the one who supplies what we need when we need it. And he is the one who sustains us and supports us in the midst of our difficulty and he does so he uh, announces himself as the true vine because what he wants you and I to understand is that there is power that is uh, that that rather the power that we need to advance and accomplish what God desires for us to accomplish and advance in this Christian walk comes from an intimate relationship with the true vine Jesus again is on his way to the cross And as he is having his last conversation with the disciples, Jesus wants to use this time to give them some sense of encouragement to sustain them through the events that were ahead of them over the next couple of days. And so he uses this illustration of a grapevine and he uses this illustration of its branches. And I contend, Pastor Clark, that the point that Jesus wants to make here, the central theme and thought that Jesus wants for us to get is that even though there were difficult days ahead of them and though they may find themselves in a situation where they are frantic, flustered, fearful and fragile, Jesus wants them to know that if they stay connected to the vine, if they remain close, if they were willing to persevere, if they were willing to endure and persist in maintaining their connection with Jesus and what Jesus taught them, they would be able to navigate tough times in a way that would lead to producing producing fruit. I believe Jesus understood that there were tough times ahead of these disciples, that the key to their survival would be their intimate ability to stay connected to the power source. You do understand, ladies and gentlemen, that there is power in partnership. There is power in the right relationships. In fact, many of you understand this quite well because you've heard time and time again that if you ever wanted to progress in life, you don't need, you need rather the right partnerships because when it comes to progress in this life, it ain't about always what you know. It's about who you know. I messed that up. Let me go back and get that again. For many of us, when it comes to progressing in life, we understand that the right partnership is significant because it's not always what you know it's who you know you see knowing the right people gives you access to power that you would not normally have without their influence sometimes when you have the right partnerships with the right person you can wield power in places that you could not do by yourself think about it if you had the right connection with somebody at the White House while Obama was in office you could have went to the White House for 
dinner if you knew somebody who had access and power in the Cowboys organization perhaps you were able uh, to sit in the skybox or maybe even hang out sideline at the Cowboys game if you know somebody uh, in the music industry when your favorite artist comes in the town your connection with them could give you access to the backstage of the concert because progress happens by who you know not always what you know and I'm convinced ladies and gentlemen that this statement has never been more true than when it comes to our relationship with Jesus because there is power in partnership and God says listen when you choose to stay connected to me I feel like preaching very early in the sermon I'll make sure that you gain access to power over demons devils and difficulties so that it you have power to demons devils and difficulties that you would not have by yourself God says when you stay connected to the source I'll give you power so that whatever you bind on earth hallelujah would be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven but it requires that you and I stay connected to the right person and I'm not sure who I'm preaching to and I'm not sure what you're facing ladies and gentlemen but I'm convinced that that what God wants us to understand from this text is that when we are intimately connected to Jesus, he wants to remind us that we are connected to the one who has life-giving power. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I came to remind somebody that if you are in relationship with Jesus, you're connected to the one who can do anything but fail. You're connected to the one who can make ways out of nowhere. You're connected to the one who opens doors that no man can open. You're connected to the one who spoke into the night of nothingness and brought forth daylight and when we reach out to him God gives us the strength and the stamina to stand in the face of difficult moments why because there is power in the right partnership and so Jesus tells us that we ought to stay connected because there is power in partnership but move but as I move let me say secondly Jesus encourages us to stay connected despite Despite the process. Jesus highlights in verse 2 the process of production. L listen to what he says. He says, I, I, I am the true vine, verse 1, and my father is the gardener. He, here's the process. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even the more fruitful. Jesus says to us here that in order for us <clears throat> to experience the most of our connection with him, there has to be a process that takes place because the gardener understands that on every vine there are two kinds of branches. Those that bear fruit and those that don't. That There's a process to productivity and, and there are two things that I need you to understand about process this particular process, it's this. Here's the first thing. Uh, the, the process has purpose, but here's the other thing. The process is painful. And for somebody who's watching me this weekend, if we are honest, this is where many of us get disconnected. And this is where we choose to drop off from our connection with the true vine. Because if we are honest, all we want is productivity without process. Jesus says, listen, there is no purpose without process and there is no productivity without some level of pain. So watch what God does. The text is clear. If you and I are going to experience the best of the relationship that, uh, that we have, if we're going to experience the best that the relationship with God has to offer, God says, I need you to be willing to surrender and to submit to seasons of cutting, cleaning, and cultivating. Cutting, cleaning, and cultivating. I promise I'm not making this up. Watch the text. Jesus says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the gardener, God, cuts off. Which says to us, ladies and gentlemen, that every now and then God will correct us based on our lack of productivity. Because when we are not producing, the text says the gardener cuts us off. 
Now, scholars, ladies and gentlemen, have been debating for centuries what this idea of God cutting us off really means. There are those who would read this text and suggest that what Jesus is saying here is that those of us who are not producing, God no longer, has, no longer wants to have anything to do with us. They read this to mean that our seasons of unproductive living cause us to be useless to God. And because we are useless to God, many theologians uh, surmise that God... God cuts us off. But when you do an etymological study on this phrase cut off, you discover that the word that is translated here or the phrase that is translated here cut off is the Greek word arrow or arrow, which interestingly enough does not mean to cut off. Watch it. It actually means to lift up. God Almighty. So, so the correct and appropriate reading of verse 2 should actually read that every branch in me that doesn't produce fruit, the Father lifts up. It, it lends itself to the picture of the gardener taking branches that have been growing down toward the dirt and lifting it up in a higher place. I feel the Holy Ghost now. Now the reason he does this is because he understands that the reason that the branches aren't producing have nothing to do with their capability of producing but he understands that the reason perhaps that the branch isn't producing might be because there's something dirty in the environment so don't miss it instead of completely eliminating the branch because the branch is not meeting expectations the gardener instead of eliminating the branch chooses to elevate the branch or lift it up and give it another chance to do what it was created to do and I'm about to shout out these double monk loafers because when I read about this and when I look at this I cannot help but see a picture of grace to me because if the truth be told some of us have not been as productive as we've needed to be the reality for some of us is that Based on what we have been gifted with, we should be producing a whole lot more than we've been producing. There have been seasons in our lives where we've missed the mark and fallen short and missed the expectations that God has set for us. And if we are honest, the truth of the matter is, for some of us, the reason why we have been experiencing unproductive seasons ain't because of our capability to produce, but it's because we far too often found our spending too much time in the dirt mm -hmm. I wish I had somebody who would be real with your boy this weekend because I know you're saved sanctified and filled with the precious Holy Ghost but if you are honest there are seasons in your life watch this since you've been saved where you've been willing to forego seasons of fruitfulness because you were too busy hanging out in some dirty places and around some dirty people and God says okay here's what I'm going to do I'm going to arrow you I'm going to give you another chance I'm going to lift you up from the dirt and clean you through my discipline because I'm going to clean you instead of cutting you because I recognize you're too valuable to cut off so instead of cutting you off I'm going to clean you up Friend, that's what God does, ladies and gentlemen, with unproductive branches. God will intervene and take us through processes of discipline to remind us of the fruit producing value that we have on the inside of us and I wish I had somebody who could pause and help me praise God in the cyber sanctuary because the good news of this text is this in spite of how dirty and unproductive we may be God would rather discipline me than throw me away I know this is a strange place to praise God but church I give God praise this weekend because when God had every right to cut me off he chose to lift me up I hope I'm not in this cyber sanctuary by myself is there anybody here who's grateful that he didn't cut you off when he had every right and reason to cut you off somebody can testify I should have died in the dirt but instead of cutting me off God cleaned me up and when you look at your life you can testify that yeah the discipline hurt and yeah the discipline was hard but church here's why I'm shouting this weekend because even though the discipline hurt and even though the discipline was hard at least when he was disciplining me disciplining me at least he still had his hands on me 
I got to move. I got to move, but, but that's part of the process. He says part of the process, Marcus, is, 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 is cleaning up every branch that doesn't produce. But, but that's not all. Here, here's the other part of the process. J Jesus says, not only does the Father clean unproductive branches, PC, but he says in verse 2 again, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the picture of cultivating, which, when you lay it out in layman's term, is just another way of saying God cuts away. Now, I got to wrestle with this. I've been wrestling with this all week because if I'm honest, I'm confused here because you would think that the text would read, and every branch that does not bear fruit, he leaves alone. That, that's what you would think. I, I, mean, I mean, I can understand God disciplining unproductive branches, but, but, but why do you have to cut on the branches that you know are producing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told y'all earlier, uh, I'm a city boy. I have no green thumb. I don't know no better. And while I don't have a clue of how this gardening process works, what I have heard is they tell me that when the gardener sees branches that are producing fruit, he wants to make sure that the branch continues to produce fruit. And so every now and then, he expects the branch. And if there is anything on the branch or near the branch that could potentially make that branch unproductive in the future, he cuts it off. You see, every good gardener knows that there are things that have a tendency to latch on to what's producing. And the gardener knows that if that thing latches on and hangs around too long, it'll begin to rob the branch of its strength and vitality. And so he goes up to the branch and starts cutting away all the useless branches. He'll cut away all the bugs. He'll cut away, watch this, all the leaves because he understands that though the leaves make the branch look good, they rob them of nutritional value. He cuts away everything that consumes life, That but but. He cuts away everything that consumes life that produces because for him, the goal of the branch isn't merely to produce fruit. No, the goal of the branches are to produce much fruit. And anything that gets in the way of the branch producing much fruit, it's got to go. And so God cuts away for growth. For somebody here who's watching me, I just helped you. To understand what's been happening in your life over the last six months. I just liberated somebody because you've been trying to figure out why did it seem like as soon as things were starting to come together, as soon as you began to become fruitful, just in the middle of you making some form of progress, right when you were finally finding your groove, you looked up and all of a sudden stuff that used to work for you no longer works. And people who you used to be able to lean on stopped talking to you for all of a sudden for no apparent reason. And stuff that you used to enjoy doing no longer appeases you, God says. The reason why is because when I began to see your fruit producing potential and saw what had attached itself to you, I had to start cutting that stuff away because I recognized that if I didn't cut that stuff and if I didn't cut those people, you would settle for just producing what you've been producing. And you would have never received the nutrients that you need to move from, from merely producing fruit to producing much fruit. I wish I had a voice. You see, you, see, you see, one of the deceitful strategies of the enemy is to weaken our spiritual productivity by attaching useless, lifeless, insignificant, and dead things to our lives. So God, every now and then, has to take his sanctified scissors. And starts cutting away at everything and everybody that's been sapping life out of you. Can I help somebody here? God says that's what's part of that's that's part of what this pandemic has been about for some of you. God says this has been a season of cutting away. It's been a season of cutting back because for some of us, we had too much stuff pulling on us. We had too many things attached to us. We had too many people who were pulling us away from purpose. And so God says, I had to cut them away. I had to cut away stuff you thought you needed. 
And I had to cut away people who you thought you couldn't live without because they were preventing you from being productive. I can't get no help here. And so God says, listen, I know the cutting hurts and I know it doesn't make sense, but I had to cut it because here's what I need you to understand. If it ain't going to help you grow, it's got to go. God, that's a, that's a Facebook post right there, is it not? If it ain't helping me grow, it's got to go. If they ain't going to help me grow, they got to go because God says I put something in you that your eyes have never seen and your ears have never heard and I don't need you settling for producing just enough when I've given you the capacity to produce more, much fruit. And so the text teaches us that we've got to stay connected because of the right partnership and the power that is attached to the right partnership. He tells us stay connected despite the process. But thirdly, he says stay connected for productivity. L listen to what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, I, I, am the I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. I don't know if you've picked up on this or not, but God, he has a desire for all of our lives, and that desire is for us to produce fruit, to be productive, to be fruitful, to have something to which others can come to us, and when they come to us, they can find something in us that has meaning and substance. God wants us to produce. That's God's goal for our lives. He wants us to bear, in the language of H.B. Charles out of Jacksonville, actual abundant and abiding fruit for his glory. Matthew chapter 21 verse 19 tells us that one day Jesus was on a walk with the disciples and on his walk he sees a fig tree by the wayside and he goes to it, goes up to it and he finds nothing on the tree but leaves and he said to the tree may no fruit ever come from you ever again and the fig tree the bible says withered up and died why because it's unacceptable and unnatural for things that are supposed to produce fruit to not be producing fruit it's unacceptable and it's unnatural but here what jesus wants us to understand he makes it clear that the only way that you and I are ever going to produce fruit for the kingdom is only through our capacity to stay connected to the vine. It comes through our capacity, hear me, to abide in the vine. And what this calls us to, ladies and gentlemen, is to be more vigilant, to be more intentional. We must remain closely connected to Christ at all times. Why? Because... God understands what we don't understand quite yet, and that's this. You and I can't produce fruit by merely being attached to the vine. No, Jesus says if you want to produce, you've got to abide in the vine, and here's the reason why. Because at the end of the day, the vine is the one who is the one who is actually producing the fruit. You see, fruit may be produced in us, but fruit is not produced by us. Why? Because in and unto themselves a branch is useless. Which is why the text says when it is detached from the vine, it dies immediately. And I think this is a good place to stop and remind somebody that all of us are nothing more than just branches. I, I'm a branch. You're a branch. And because we're branches, we don't have what it takes to produce fruit. Only the vine can produce fruit. And I'm preaching to somebody this weekend. And I think this is why God had me to say this because you watching me and the reality of your life is that you've accomplished some things in life. You got a few degrees of sheepskin on your wall. You got people who have given you some level of influence in their lives. You got people who count on you for wisdom and guidance because you do a couple of things 
pretty well. I'm preaching to people who think they have it going on because you've got some level of modicum of intelligence and strength. God says, listen, don't you ever get it twisted. You did not get to where you are because of you. No, you didn't achieve what you achieved because of what you knew because what you are, God made you. And what you have, it was God who gave it to you. What you know, it was God who taught you. And where you are right now, sitting in your living room, kitchen, bedroom, dining room wherever you are it wasn't nobody but the Lord who brought that to you God says the biggest mistake you and I could ever make is to allow things to make us to forget that outside of connection to Christ we can't accomplish anything I love what Warren Wisby says he says the sooner we as believers discover that we are nothing more than branches the better we can relate to God for it is only then that we will know our own weakness and call out to God for the strength that he provides. I don't know who this is for, but I hear God saying to somebody, you better be very careful trying to produce fruit in the flesh. You better be very careful trying to accomplish God-sized goals in the flesh. God says perhaps that's the reason why we got so many burnt out believers who become frustrated with their faith. Because you're trying to produce fruit in the flesh. You're trying to accomplish God-sized goals through your ingenuity. You keep trying to make stuff happen in your own strength, but God says it don't work like that. So I got a question for you. What, what, what you trying to accomplish in this new season of your life? You, you, you trying to be a good parent? Can I tell you? The only way you're going to be a good parent is to stay connected to the vine. You're looking to become more loving. The only way you're going to become more loving if, is if you stay connected to the vine. You're trying to do your part to maintain your marriage. The only way that's going to happen is if you stay connected to the vine. Because as long as you stay connected to the vine, you have all that you need to produce fruit. Because in fact, I hear what Paul says in Philippians 4.13 when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So... Stay connected for power and partnership. Stay connected in spite of the process. Stay connected for productivity. But finally, stay connected to receive the promise. I'm done, but what this text teaches us is that when we stay connected to the vine of Jesus Christ, we are in the perfect position to receive promises. Here's the last question I want to ask. The ask of the text is this. What, what promises can we receive by staying connected? Well, the text gives us two. I'll highlight them really quickly and I'll go to my seat. Here's the first one. We get the promise, first of all, of answered prayer. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 7. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. Jesus says that as we abide in Christ, watch this, and we allow his word, we spend time in his word, we allow his word to abide in us, that we then can ask for what we wish, and it will be done for us. Here's the point that Jesus is making here. When God's people seek him and his will, there is nothing, no circumstance, no wall, no devil, no demon, no person that can withhold God's will from being done in your life. And so stay connected because you can receive the promise of answered prayer. But finally, he tells us stay connected because in it we receive the promise of his presence. I'm, I'm in verse 4. Listen to what he says. He says, if you abide in me listen to the promise I will remain in you in other words God says when you stay connected to me I will 
stay connected to you. I love that. That's what James uh, means when he says in James chapter 4 verse 8 that if we draw close to God, he will draw near to us. I got to go, but I think this is a good place to stop and give God praise, not for property or possessions, but give God praise for his promise. Because there are some of you, you're watching me this weekend, and you remember when everybody else walked away. I need some help, Marcus. When everybody else left, when everybody else turned their backs, when everybody else scattered, God was right there with you. And now you can testify, hallelujah, that if I lost everything, if I still got Jesus, I've got more than enough to start over again. And I wonder, is there anybody here who can help me praise God for the promise of his presence? Because in his presence, there is security. Because the Bible says, never will I leave you or never will I forsake you. You want to praise God for his promise because there is safety in his presence. Because he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the almighty there is satisfaction in his presence because I heard David say in his presence hallelujah there's the fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore it's been a couple of weeks since I've done this but I feel my soul catching on fire but there's stability in his promise because the test about whether or not we're connected to the vine is seen with our ability to withstand the storm hallelujah because when the storms of life beat up on the branch uh, the bible says that when the storms of life beat on the branches that look connected but are really disconnected those branches will break off and be blown away but church when a branch is truly connected when it's truly in relationship with the vine storms may come hallelujah and winds may blow and the branch may bend but it won't break and somebody here can testify that I thank God this weekend that he's given me stability in his presence because if the truth be told had it not been for my strong connection with God I would have been blown away a long time ago there's somebody here who can testify I didn't had enough stuff to happen to me over the last three months that should have made me lose it all I didn't had stuff happen to me that should have made me go crazy I should have had stuff that should have made me walk away from the faith I've been going through stuff that no Nobody knows about and you can testify that if it wasn't for the stability that I found in my connection I would have been gone with the wind somebody can testify I went through stuff that made me bend but the reason I didn't break when I wanted to quit the reason I didn't break when I wanted to give up when I wanted to throw in the towel the reason I didn't break when I wanted to say forget about it is because I had the promise of God stabilizing presence that made me like a tree planted by streams of water I'm done for the weekend but would you help me encourage somebody and tell them stay connected I know the storms in your life are coming in in waves but stay connected I know they are fierce but stay connected I know there are moments when you're ready to give up but stay connected I know it feels like you're not gonna make it but stay connected because you've got the promise of his presence securing you, satisfying you, and stabilizing you. So be not dismayed. Whatever be tired, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. And if you're grateful for his presence, Give God praise. Say yeah. Say yeah. Hallelujah. 
we've got the promise of God's presence. And so this weekend, I want to invite you to stay connected for power, stay connected for productivity, stay connected in spite of the process and stay connected because of the promise. But ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you one more thing? That I found in the presence of God, there is salvation in his presence. There's salvation in his presence. M many of you, if you read on, if you read on beyond John 15, you'll discover that it won't be long before we find Jesus hanging on the cross. And the Bible says he's hanging on the cross in between two thieves. The Bible says while he's hanging on that cross, one thief sees Jesus and only sees someone with whom he can attach himself to. Bible says because he only saw Jesus as an attachment he says to Jesus listen we've been hearing about all this stuff that you've been doing around town all these miracles you've been performing and if you are who you say you are why don't you go ahead and perform one more miracle for us why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself oh yeah and while you at it why don't you get us down too that was another thief, ladies and gentlemen, who was on the cross. And he didn't see Jesus as an attachment. He saw Jesus as somebody with whom he could abide in. And the Bible says that thief looked at Jesus. He says, listen, I recognize who you are, and I know that there is nothing about me that would warrant me asking you for this. But here's what I want to ask since I'm here. When you come into your kingdom, can you think about me? Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says in the language of the old black preacher, Jesus stopped dying, looked over to the man. Because he recognized that the man saw him as somebody with whom he could abide in. The Bible says Jesus looked at him and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. My brother, my sister, can I ask you a question? You're watching me. Can I ask you a quick question? How are you seeing Jesus right now? Do you only see him as an attachment to your already full, over complex, complicated life? Or do you see him as somebody who is worth putting your entire life in? If you're watching me, if you're here, and you're watching me this weekend and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, listen, I want to invite you into a covenant relationship with Jesus. I, I want to invite you to put your life in Jesus' hands for power in spite of the process, for productivity, and for the promise. Or maybe you're watching this this weekend and, 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 and you do have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but it ain't as strong as it needs to be. And the evidence of that is because you have yet to get connected to the church. If you're here this weekend, you're watching this, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you need to be connected to the church, I want to invite you this weekend to do us a favor and text JOIN to 512-746-7613. We've got people there even now, even now, who are ready to receive you and talk to you about the decision that you made and to celebrate with you your choice to either get connected or to stay connected to the vine. Why don't you text JOIN to 512-746-76113. Let me go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for the fruit that will come from it. And I pray that each of us, as a consequence of what we have heard, in and through your word, God, that we would make the conscious choice to not search always for the right conditions, but to look for a proper connection. Because there's power and productivity and a promise 
that is attached to our willingness to stay connected despite sometimes the difficulty of the process. Would you use this word to produce fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold in Jesus' name? And would you use this word to save somebody now? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.